This is Think Tech Hawaii. Welcome to this Monday show, the state of the state of Hawaii. I'm your host, Stephanie Stoll Dalton. Every two weeks, this show covers important topics, events, and interviews newsworthy sources about our state, city, and county, including government, business, economics, the pandemic, law, education, lifestyle, health, among many others. If you have a topic you'd like covered, please send it to questions at thinktechhawaii.com and I'll welcome your topic. Dr. Thomas G. White, a psychologist, and for years he was a resident of Hawaii while serving as an education researcher at the Kamehameha Schools. He reports that that experience for him was a vital and continuing influence on all of his work since at the University of Virginia in Charlottesville in research and in his teaching and for his, his current study of climate change. He'll talk to you today and to me about the psychology of climate change. Welcome, Dr. White. Tom, as I've known you long, welcome to the program. Thank you, Stephanie. Aloha. It's Thank a great to be there with you. And thanks to everybody who has you know, taken the time to do what they have to do to join us in this virtual space. Thank you. Thank you for participating um, as a guest in the state of the state of Hawaii and for our discussion on the psychology of climate change. Uh, for us living in the islands in the midst of a giant ocean, to know more about how we vary widely in our beliefs about climate change and, and our willingness to support government action or make changes in our personal lives certainly will help us to maybe work better together for our state. Why don't you begin by telling us about uh, your experience with the Kamehameha Schools? You did a pretty good job of that already, Stephanie. I mean, that was, that was quite a long time ago, 1983 to 1990. But really, you know, I, those looking back, those were some of the best years of my life. And uh, you know, I can say in all honesty, be, being employed by the, what at that time was the research arm of the Kamehameha Schools was the Kamehameha Elementary Education Program, or KEEP. And what, what made that work so exciting was that KEEP had a mission. The mission was to improve reading outcomes for Native Hawaiian kids in the public schools of Hawaii. And that was just, just a really exciting time in my life. And I think, as you already said, that experience really led me to focus the rest of my career on reading programs for low-income children. So I'm always, I'd always be grateful for that. That's wonderful, and uh, and it's uh, really precious to hear you you took so much from that work, and I think so many of us did. But then, how did you uh, move out of the education research uh, domain and over into looking and studying climate change? Yeah, or, I think that I think uh, you know my interest in climate change also has roots uh, going back to Hawaii. So I mean, you lucky you live Hawaii. Right? I, mean, I, I mean, it's so beautiful, the natural beauty, the islands, the the extreme biodiversity, the you know the ocean, the mountains, the tropical forests, the birds, the rainbows, the trade winds. I mean, I can almost feel it. Just thinking about it, to, to me, it was it was beyond beautiful and awesome. It, it, it was sacred and it was eternal. And it was just something that had to be preserved for, for future generations. So, you know, I, I know I know you folks in Hawaii are already looking towards the future. So I, I want to congratulate you on being the first state to uh, you know, to require 100% renewable power by 2045, that's, that's great. I didn't know that till I started getting ready for this program. <laughs> um, you know, but the leaders and the government is taking responsibility um, and, and providing leadership in this manner. Of course, you know, we have the pandemic, which kind of throws a wrench into everything as far as budgets, including the federal is concerned, but I'm glad you noticed. And I mean, it's good to hear you say that from far away to know that we're looking progressive out here. It, I mean, that was 2015, so that's been a while. And then, and of course, I know that, uh, you know, that you all out there are very much concerned about 
sea level rise being surrounded by the ocean, as you mentioned. Uh, so I, that's another thing I did. I took a look at the 2017 report from the Hawaii Climate Change Mitigation and Adaptation Commission. And uh, I, was, I was amazed that, that there's a statement in there that indicates the potential for economic loss to the state of Hawaii is on the order of $19 billion. So that's really significant. The projections that you've probably seen that much of Waikiki could be underwater by 2100. And of course, that's a major economic engine for you out there. So I know you all are very much concerned about that. Well, I don't know about the, um, that 2100 is just sounding a little bit too close. I mean, actually not personally, but I, I really hadn't seen that number, but I think that's important to draw attention to. And certainly we're already getting a taste of what this would be with the hit of the pipe pandemic on our tourism part of the economy, which is most of the part of the economy. So uh, we're into a portion of that loss already. But um, I think that, uh, we're gonna to have to learn how to live. Um, and so hopefully this experience will get us uh, some new diversification of the economy and some new ideas about what we're gonna to do to avoid that because Waikiki can't, that's the golden egg. I mean, that's a very important source as you know. Well, I know you said that Tom, you're not a per se climate scientist in the lab with your algae and your leaves and whatever they do, but I, um, or maybe they're looking out into space to the satellites and for that. But with, as a psychologist, um, what, what is your major focus on uh, climate change? Yeah, well, I'm, I'm interested really in the question of why some people believe that the earth is warming and that human activity is the cause. And you know, why, why other people believe that the earth is not getting warmer or they, they, they believe that if it is getting warmer, that it's just part of a natural cycle. So there's that, there's, I think you alluded to this already, people are different in the degree to which they're willing to support policies. Uh, you know, for example, reducing fossil fuel consumption, or reducing greenhouse gas emissions, especially carbon dioxide. And of course, people are very different in terms of what they're, they're willing to do in their personal lives. So for example, flying less or installing solar panels on their roof. So that's the general interest. It's a fascinating topic. Uh, and I, I found uh, that it's, it's endlessly fascinating actually, really. So I've been, in, I've been interested in really learning a lot about it, about it for the past three years since I retired. Well, I think that uh, you mentioned the solar panels, which just makes me want to comment on how much of that actually is going on. I don't know who, how much of it is driven by uh, climate change as it is by the electric bills here. Sure. Because we're totally, as you say, we're moving what towards being off of the fossil fuels, but we're not yet. And that huge tanker is coming in every day, loaded with oil just for the electricity out here. So it's rather shocking how completely depending we, we really are on it. So, but I was just gonna mention, there's another, there are always multiple factors influencing these things, right? And electricity is, is one that will help us move in the right direction, I hope, yeah. But uh, yeah, so I mean, what do, do you see, you focus on specific um, factors that are um, the, the, the features of these attitudes and beliefs that we have. And so what, can you tell us a little more about that in your study? Well, let, let me give you just some general information uh, to, to get sort of set a broader context. So, uh, you know, you've heard about deniers and you've heard about alarmists. And then, but then there's really, this is important to recognize because these are the people that are going to make a difference, the people in the middle. So there's a lot of people between those extremes there, there are national surveys that show, for example, there's a group of people who are concerned. So they believe that climate is happening and it's human caused, but they aren't doing anything about it. So they're sort of concerned bystanders. And that group is 28% of the population. And there's a cautious group, about 20%, who aren't sure if, if global warming is happening or if it's human caused. 
And there's a doubtful group, about 11%, who say that if the Earth is getting warmer, it's just part of a natural cycle. And there's a disengaged, disengaged group, it's about 7%. People just aren't paying attention. So that's a total of 66% somewhere in the middle. The alarmists are 26% and the deniers are 7 or 8%. So is that a national trend, uh, and, and we and Hawaii would be included in that? Well, that that's well, that's a great a great thought, a great question. That, those were national figures that I just gave you, and uh, you know what's interesting is that Hawaii really looks quite different from the rest of the country in terms of these kinds of climate change beliefs. Uh, there's a website that you can go to that's that's run by the Yale Center for Climate Change Communication. And they do a survey every year. It's got about 30 questions tapping people's climate change beliefs and their willingness to take action, all the stuff we've just talked about. And you can actually drill down to the state level and even the county level. So I did that, I did that uh, the other day and I, I found out this is I think very this will interest your your, uh, your viewers. So in 2020, 55% of US adults agreed with this statement. Most scientists think global warming is happening. But 70% of Honolulu County residents agreed with that statement. So 15 percentage points higher than the national average. That's significantly different from the national average. There, there are counties in Texas where the percentage who agree with that statement is 31%, like less than half of what you have in Honolulu. So, you know, these Texans believe there's a lot of disagreement among scientists. Well, what would you see influencing that difference? How to account for that? Well, you know, I mean, I, I thought you were gonna ask me about politics, but... <laughs> Is it all politics? Can it be all politics? I don't think it's all politics. I mean, of course, Hawaii is, is heavily democratic and you know Biden won 64% of the vote there. He has an ambitious plan to address climate change, as many of you know. Uh, uh, he wants to bring us back to the Paris Climate Accords and so on. And, and of course, I mean, we do have, I can't, I'm not gonna say that uh, politics doesn't play a role. There's a lot of research in social science Group identification is very important, uh, very powerful influence on human beings' beliefs and behaviors. And, uh, you know, uh, political affiliation is one kind of group identity. And it's increasingly important in, in our lives. For, for instance, many young people these days uh, won't date. They say they won't date somebody whose political beliefs are different from theirs. But I, but I really hope that in this conversation, we can get past the politics of climate change. I mean, my, my belief is that the political split that we see on this issue is really just the surface of things. So it's a surface manifestation of these underlying psychological processes. And there are a couple of them that, I, that I'd, uh, I'd like to talk about. I'm happy to talk about a little bit, the two that I think are probably the most important. That's really interesting. Please do. Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, the first one, and if, if I could have the first graphic, please, uh, the gateway belief model, there it is. I hope everybody can see that. So this is the, the process, is the perception of scientific consensus. This graph will kind of help you understand it. So according to a social psychologist, Sander van der Linden, a perceived scientific agreement is a gateway belief. And what he means by that is when perceived scientific agreement increases, then the other beliefs that you can see are, are also affected. So belief in climate change, worry about climate change, belief in human causation, all of those things go up if the perceived scientific consensus goes up. And they, then there are cascading effects going down to the, those three things in the middle, then in turn influence support for public action. So there's, there's several actually good experimental studies that show this, that this, this model really does operate. And I think, you know, so I think you, you all know that uh, what you could call consensus messaging, it, it does happen in the real world. So you've all probably heard the figure 97% of climate scientists believe that global warming is happening. 
and caused by human activity. Uh, I think you know that tw Bar Barack Obama tweeted that out a few years and really uh, put it on people's radar screen. Yeah, but but perhaps other people have heard that the scientists disagree. We just talked about some of the people in Texas. You know, and perhaps even that the 97% claim is a fabrication. So, uh, it, so if you if you uh, Google, well, let, let me wait. Let me back up. We got the next graphic already. That's good. Thank you. So, there have been seven independent studies on this issue of scientific consensus, and in which the researchers do one of several things. They can send written surveys out to the scientists. They can interview the scientists or they can code abstracts of scientific papers using trained raters. You can see the results of the graphics. So there's been these seven studies. The range is from like 91 to 100% of scientists who say that global warming is happening and that human, uh, there is a human causality involved, that uh, human activity is at least partly responsible. And you can see that like, uh, there's a cluster there for the seven studies are 97%. But there is a really important qual uh, qualification to these studies that is not reported uh, in the media typically, uh, or is it, nor is it mentioned by the alarmist, some alarmist politicians. These are the percentages for climate experts. So climate experts, are scientists with doctoral degrees who are publishing peer-reviewed research on climate science. If you have an MS degree in physics or even a PhD and you're not publishing, then you're not an expert uh, as is as defined in these studies. So now if you Google 97% consensus, you can find lots of websites that attack the idea of the scientific consensus on climate change. These are so-called denier websites. They're usually run by non-scientists, many of whom actually have ties to the fossil fuel industry. Hmm. Is and that the commercial factor is in there strongly? You, you can find that some of them I've even I've studied a lot of them, and some of them, if you go, if you click on the about, they'll even tell you that they've received funding from Exxon or you know one of the one of the um, a fossil fuel company. So it's, I would advise people to always check, you know, what's the source? Is it, is it a credible source? Uh, is, it, is it based on peer-reviewed scientific research? And what is the funding? That's a critical question. But anyway, if so you go, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to note, so these are scientists, nevertheless, whether they work for Shell Oil or not, but that they will allow I mean, they, they, they are not dedicated to the scientific method of, of proof of- these, are, these websites are run by non-scientists. If you check the credentials of the people who run them, they're oh. not scientists. They're oh. not scientists. Now there are, you know, there are a few contrarian scientists. There is a 3%. And that's a, you know, that's a very interesting group. We need to have contrarian scientists because that's the way scientists, science works. We argue about science all the time. And despite all these arguments over data, and there are some wonderful examples of this, we don't have time to go into, but uh, you know, despite all that, this strong consensus emerges. So that, that's really important. But I wanna go back to this, the denier websites, just as, as an example, if you go to these websites, you can find, so the graphic had a, a study in the middle uh, by Stenhouse, which gave a 93% figure. And you can go to these denier websites. This, this study was a study by, uh, of members of the American Meteorological Society. And these denier websites will, will say, oh, the consensus is only 52%, not 97%. But if you read the original article as I have, you'll find a table of columns. On the right, there's, there is in fact a 52%. That is for the full membership of the American Meteorological Society. So that, all, that includes your local weathermen and ladies, people who don't have training in climate science. But then on the left, in the very same article, it was a result for members of the AMS who specialize in climate science and who have published in climate science, the percentage of those people who say global warming is happening and human cost, 78%. 
Then in a follow-up study of those who said there was not sufficient evidence to say mostly, another 10% said global warming was equally human and naturally caused. And another 5% said there was some evidence for human causation. So that's a total of 93%. But the, the, the Dyer website doesn't mention this. They yeah. focus, they cherry pick the 52%. So yeah. this, about that. Yeah. this is what's called disinformation, intentionally spreading false information or misleading information. And the goal is to delay action on climate change because these people know, just as the gateway model suggests, that one of the best ways to, to delay action is to try to undermine belief in the scientific consensus. That is just frightening, isn't it? And then there's that impact then that they can have uh, on government um, policy and, and action. Yeah, right. It's been, it's been going on for about 30 years. If you go back 30 years ago, what's, what's really interesting is that if you go back 30 years ago, there was very little difference between Democrats and Republicans in terms of support for state emissions reductions. Well, is that, now, now is that the, the, what kind of research is that? Do they, I mean, do, are they in this uh, quantitative versus qualitative uh, diet, it, it, um, balance as we are in education? I mean, this kind of research, are they doing this uh, uh, and with using the typical rigu rigorous scientific methods, um, randomization and using all of those uh, protections for finding out what what the associate what the connections are. Well, it's it's quantitative. It is quantitative. It can't it cannot be experimental. But it's it's really just descriptive. They're just asking people what they think, or uh, you know, a rating what the papers say. Mm -hmm. And you know, I've I've examined it, so I've read most of those studies. There are there there are questions raised, for for example, uh, some of the studies of abstracts. There's they find a lot of abstracts that that where they can't really determine what the position is on global warming from the abstract. So what they did in those studies is they just set those aside, and then they based their percentage on the papers that did take a position. Mm -hmm. Now that's got a lot of criticism, but again, uh, it, it's there's been an attempt to, um, you know, dis, to uh, spreading disinformation, attempt to discredit that. What they don't tell you is that, that say, in that same study, they actually followed up with with talking to the scientists whose papers they were rating, and and those, and then they asked the scientists, "Did we have you?" classified correctly or not. Well, when they, really the raters were just being conservative and saying they didn't know because when they, when they did that, the percentage of papers that was not taken position shrunk way down. And then what's really interesting is, you know, papers would move from the category of no position to either yes, there's global warming or no, there's not. Guess what percentage moved what in, in the author's own judgment when they could talk more and say what was really in their paper, the rest of the paper, guess what percentage moved into the yes category? A lot, I would 90, guess. 95 percent. <laughs> right, yes, very so, good. So, you know, this research really is pretty solid for, for what it is. It's not experimental. You can't you can't really assign people to you know believe something or not or say something or not, but yeah. you know, it's it's about as solid as it could be. And 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 it's really been unfairly uh, uh, characterized. Yeah. On, on well, some of well, what are the, we're talking about psycholo the psychological processes here. So now we've talked about, um, can you just go back over those two and talk about the second one that maybe fully really covered yet? Yeah, yeah, the second one. So, but I wanna be real clear about this. The 97% percent consensus doesn't mean that 97% percent of the scientists say we should take a particular policy action. What, what the scientists are saying is that we, well, the climate experts, say, our experts are saying that we think there's a problem and we should do something about it. But that something really depends on morals. So let's talk quickly about morals. Let's just go right to the graphic here. Graphic number three. 
So this is from a social psychologist, Jonathan Haidt. And what he finds, people are born with what he calls these moral sensitivities. They're kind of like taste buds. You know, we have sweet, sour, salt, or bitty, bitter, and umami, which is soy sauce. Thank goodness for that, or we wouldn't be able to, you know, enjoy our tuna with wasabi. But he, he finds that these differ uh, as a function of political leanings. So uh, care is really being concerned about uh, harm to people and, and care for people. Uh, I'll do the liberty one that's, you know, concerned with uh, liberty and oppression, like, for example, oppression by a government taking away liberties. And finally, sanct sanctity over here is uh, concerned with sensitivity to uh, uh, threats to human health and sacred values. Now, some of the research uh, supporting this is really interesting because what they'll do, for example, uh, they will present people with uh, two different versions of a speech on climate change. One version is free market friendly. For example, the US could lead the world in green technology. And the other would be heavily regulatory, emphasizing government restrictions on emissions and the burn, from the burning of fossil fuels. And what, uh, when the, what's fascinating, when Republicans hear the free market speech, they're more likely to say that the earth is warming I may repeat that. Republicans are more likely to say the earth is warming. In other words, they believe in the science more when they get the free market uh, framing. So the, the implication is that they're not any science. They just don't like the climate change solutions that are put forth by the Democrats. Other studies show that Republican support for uh, government action on climate change is increased when the framing is uh, human health, air, air pollution, and its negative impacts. So. Um, Want me to wrap up here quick? Yeah, well, but on that, right now, just could you summarize that again, please? Because the Republicans will, when presented uh, with anything that's a solution from the other side, find themselves uh, reticent. But if they get other information, they they're positive on it. That's actually so. So what it's what it's saying is another way to say it is that. Uh, what drives a lot of climate change beliefs is what is called solution aversion. So the Republicans are afraid of the solutions. And it's not that they are anti-science. They're afraid of the solutions, which is so what we have to do is we have to come up with solutions that really draw on the moral values or moral sensitivities of all the constituent groups. That's Very right. importantly, we could pull in conservatives if we talk more about threats to human health. What's the what is the co-benefit of reducing, you know, coal burning is going to save a lot of lives. It'll it'll uh, you know reduce the number of deaths by cancer, a lot, reduce problems with asthma, and so on. So that's an argument you can make. You know that everybody should be able to get behind. Yeah. So, so that's the point of of this um, these moral sensitivities kind of thing. Can you come up with another example like that? Um, well, well, the other one, there, there are a number of framing studies. There's, there's another one. I mentioned the one about um, human health, but there are others where they, they make climate change a more of a patriotic thing. We can address, we, we can, you know, as a country, we can be leaders that lead the world, America the great, you know, a kind of thing. And that would appeal to uh, one of the columns that I had in the chart was, um, um, I think it's called authority. And so if you make an appeal to nationalism, that also can pull in more conservative folks. So there, there are a number of, of studies like this. And I think, I think they really are pointing us in the right direction, which, which is basically, uh, let's start talking solutions. And let's, let's stop arguing about the science. Let's talk solutions. Oh, that is really interesting, Tom. Yes. Well, did you want to summarize uh, briefly? And then uh, we'll need to wrap. Yeah, yeah I think just to uh, go uh, loop back around to the question of why, why Hawaiians seem to be ahead of the curve on climate change. So, so democratic politics aside, you know, there is that very real thing of sea level rise that has to be uh, very important. I mean, just based on what I've said tonight, I think we could probably say that it's apparent that your educators and your media sources are doing a pretty good job of building trust in scientific expertise 
you know, helping people weed out unreliable sources and disinformation. That that's very important. Then then finally, you know, this there's no research on this, but I wonder if uh, native Hawaiian culture and values has it, you know, may have played a role here. So, uh, you know, there's the concept of aloha aina, which means love of the land. It's a central idea in native Hawaiian thought. There's the uh, related idea of malama, which means to preserve and protect. So I think maybe that's had something to do with why you're doing so well in Hawaii. And you know, that, that's the sort of perspective that's needed in places like Texas. Yeah, evidently, that's very helpful and uh, very um, much uh, important to our whole Aloha State notion of how we do respect um, the cultural influences here and want to live by them and with them and through them. So that's really beautiful, Tom. Thank you. But it is Aloha time and we'll have to wrap it up. So um, I'm Stephanie Stoll Dalton and this is the state of the state of Hawaii on the Think Tech live streaming network series. So we uh, have been talking remotely with Dr. Tom White about the psychology of climate change. And I think we've learned some things about how to move forward with our challenges and uh, communications on this. So I'll see you again in two weeks on the next program, the state of the state of Hawaii. Mahalo for your attention, everyone.